So today we're talking about dimension and I'm going to end off today's discussion on dimension just doing some more examples so you get comfortable with this. And also we're kind of tying pieces together that we've seen through the course. So first of all, we have, let's go back to matrices, which are kind of, you know, first week material. And we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks is that you have spaces, subspaces attached to the matrix, and we can compute its basis. So remember the null space is the set of all vectors that when you multiply by A, give you zero. And the column space of A is the span of all the vector columns. And so what we want to be able to do is compute the dimension of both of these guys. And because we know how to find the basis, we can actually figure out very easily how to figure out the dimension of the null space. It just follows directly from what we did before. And the dimension of the null space is just simply the number of free variables in the equation ax equals zero. So you have to row reduce your matrix, put it into reduced row echelon form and count the number of free variables. But the column space also has that information, the number of basis elements is also in the reduced row echelon form. And so the dimension of the column space is the number of pivot columns of A. So way back in week one, I told you the importance of the free variables and the pivot columns. And again, we're seeing that information is important because that's related to the dimensions of particular subspaces. So as an example, here I have a matrix. It's already put into reduced row echelon form. And I can just look at my matrix and say, well, the dimension of the null space is three because I have a free variable for this column, this, uh, the second column, the fourth column, and the fifth column. And the dimension of the column space is two because here are the pivots. So that's very nice. We can use all the information that we talked about in the last couple lectures, but to figure out the dimensions very quickly. I thought I would end off by doing a, a little bit more complicated example. Oops. Move it here. So here are three polynomials and they're called the Hermite polynomials. And they show up in a different area of math, but they have a nice property that um, you can show that uh, at least the first three are a basis for P2. And you can actually keep extending this. I'm just doing a special case. So there's a there's a Hermite polynomial P4. And if you throw that in, you get a basis for P3 and so on. But instead, what I'm going to just do is show that the first Hermite polynomials form a basis for P2. And what we want to do is take advantage of the fact that it, we know the dimension of P2. So our solution goes as follows. So the dimension of P2 is three. So we only need to show that P1T, P2T, and P3T are linearly independent. So if we can show that these three polynomials are linearly independent in a three-dimensional vector space, we go back here and we can use the basis theorem, right? Because we have a three-dimensional vector space, we would have three linear independent vectors, and then it would form a basis. So that's our strategy, right? And let's try to look at why it's true. Okay, so we're looking at this polynomial, C1 times the first polynomial plus C2 times the second polynomial plus C3 times the last polynomial. And we can ex expand out and collect terms. So we have C1 times one minus two C3 plus two C2 times T plus 4c3 t squared, and we want that equal to the zero polynomial. Okay, and now if you stare at this for a second, this can only happen if the following happens. First of all, 
the coefficient of t squared has to be zero. So I gotta write it like this. C3 has to be zero. But now let's look at the coefficient of C2. It has to be, uh, sorry, the coefficient of t. It only involves a C2. So the only way that this part can equal zero is if C2 is zero. Now we've already said that this part, the C3 is zero. So C1 times one has to be zero. So it gives you me one. Okay, so these polynomials are linearly independent and by the basis, not, not basis, by the basis theorem, what we have is that P1T, P2T, P3T is a basis since we have three linearly independent elements in a three dimension dimensional vector space. Okay, so that, here, that's kind of messy. Let me fix that up for you. So here we have an example of using the basis theorem in order to uh, com compute a, ba a basis for a particular sub uh, vector space. So the kind of the key idea for today, right, is dimension. Key idea is dimension. And the notion is quite simple. It's just simply the number of elements in a basis. But from knowing just the basis, we get extra information that is sometimes very useful to understand whether we have a linear independent set or a spanning set or so on. So that's it for today's lecture. I will see you in lecture 27.